I assure you, Captain Wentworth, we are very sorry he ever left you. There was a momentary expression in Captain Wentworth's face at this speech, a certain glance of his bright eye, and curl of his handsome mouth, which convinced Anne that instead of sharing in Mrs. Musgrove's kind wishes as to her son, he had probably been at some pains to get rid of him, but it was too transient an indulgence of self-amusement to be detected by any who understood him less than herself. In another moment he was perfectly collected and serious, and almost instantly afterwards coming up to the sofa, on which she and Mrs. Musgrove were sitting, took a place by the latter, and entered into conversation with her, in a low voice, about her son, doing it with so much sympathy and natural grace, as showed the kindest consideration for all that was real and unabsurd in the parents' feelings. They were actually on the same sofa, for Mrs. Musgrove had most readily made room for him. They were divided only by Mrs. Musgrove. It was no insignificant barrier, indeed. Mrs. Musgrove was of a comfortable, substantial size, infinitely more fitted by nature to express good cheer and good humour than tenderness and sentiment, and while the agitations of Anne's slender form and pensive face may be considered as very completely screened, Captain Wentworth should be allowed some credit for the self-command with which he attended to her large, fat sighings over the destiny of a son, whom alive nobody had cared for. Personal size and mental sorrow have certainly no necessary proportions. A large, bulky figure has as good a right to be in deep affliction, as the most graceful set of limbs in the world. But, fair or not fair, there are unbecoming conjunctions which reason will patronize in vain, which taste cannot tolerate, which ridicule will seize. The admiral, after taking two or three refreshing turns about the room with his hands behind him, being called to order by his wife, now came up to Captain Wentworth and without any observation of what he might be interrupting, thinking only of his own thoughts, began with, "'If you had been a week later at Lisbon last spring, Frederick, you would have been asked to give a passage to Lady Mary Gryerson and her daughters.' "'Should I? I am glad I was not a week later, then.' The Admiral abused him for his want of gallantry. He defended himself, though professing that he would never willingly admit any ladies on board a ship of his, excepting for a ball or a visit— which a few hours might comprehend. "'But if I know myself,' said he, "'this is from no want of gallantry towards them. It is rather from feeling how impossible it is, with all one's efforts, and all one's sacrifices, to make the accommodations on board such as women ought to have. There can be no want of gallantry, Admiral, in rating the claims of women to every personal comfort high, and this is what I do. I hate to hear of women on board, or to see them on board, and no ship under my command shall ever convey a family of ladies anywhere, if I can help it." This brought his sister upon him. "'Oh, Frederick! But I cannot believe it of you! All idle refinement! Women may be as comfortable on board as in the best house in England. I believe I have lived as much on board as most women, and I know nothing superior to the accommodations of a man of war. I declare I have not a comfort or an indulgence about me, even at Kellynch Hall," with a kind bow to Anne, "'beyond what I always had in most of the ships I have lived in, and they have been five altogether." "'Nothing to the purpose,' replied her brother. "'You were living with your husband, and were the only woman on board." "'But you yourself brought Mrs. Harville, her sister, her cousin, and three children, round from Portsmouth to Plymouth. Where was this superfine, extraordinary sort of gallantry of yours, then? All merged in my friendship, Sophia. I would assist any brother officer's wife that I could, and I would bring anything of Harville's from the world's end if he wanted it. But do not imagine that I did not feel it an evil in itself. Depend upon it. They were all perfectly comfortable. I might not like them the better for that, perhaps. Such a number of women and children have no right to be comfortable on board. My dear Frederick, you are talking quite idly. Pray, what would become of us poor sailors' wives, who often want to be conveyed to one port or another, after our husbands, if everybody had your feelings? My feelings, you see, did not prevent my taking Mrs. Harville and her family to Plymouth. But I hate to hear you talking so like a fine gentleman, and as if women were all fine ladies, instead of rational creatures. We none of us expect to be in smooth water all our days." "'Ah, my dear,' said the Admiral, "'when he had got a wife, he will sing a different tune. When he is married, 
if we have the good luck to live to another war, we shall see him do as you and I, and a great many others have done. We shall have him very thankful to anybody that will bring him his wife. Aye, that we shall. Now I have done, cried Captain Wentworth. When once married people begin to attack me with, oh, you will think very differently when you are married. I can only say, no, I shall not. And then they say again, yes, you will, and there is an end of it. He got up and moved away. "'What a great traveller you must have been, ma'am,' said Mrs. Musgrove to Mrs. Croft. "'Pretty well, ma'am, in the fifteen years of my marriage, though many women have done more. I have crossed the Atlantic four times, and have been once to the East Indies and back again, and only once, besides being in different places about home—Cork, and Lisbon, and Gibraltar. But I never went beyond the Straits, and never was in the West Indies— we do not call Bermuda or Bahama, you know, the West Indies. Mrs. Musgrove had not a word to say in dissent. She could not accuse herself of ever having called them anything in the whole course of her life. And I do assure you, ma'am, pursued Mrs. Croft, that nothing can exceed the accommodation of a man of war. I speak, you know, of the higher rates. When you come to a frigate, of course, you are more confined, though any reasonable woman may be perfectly happy in one of them. And I can safely say— that the happiest part of my life has been spent on board a ship. While we were together, you know, there was nothing to be feared. Thank God, I have always been blessed with excellent health, and no climate disagrees with me. A little disordered always the first twenty-four hours of going to sea, but never knew what sickness was afterwards. The only time I ever really suffered, in body or mind, the only time that I ever fancied myself unwell, or had any ideas of danger— was the winter that I passed by myself at Deal, when the Admiral, the Captain Croft then, was in the North Seas. I lived in perpetual fright at that time, and had all manner of imaginary complaints from not knowing what to do with myself, or when I should hear from him next. But as long as we could be together, nothing ever ailed me, and I never met with the smallest inconvenience. Ay, to be sure! Yes, indeed, oh, yes! I am quite of your opinion, Mrs. Croft," was Mrs. Musgrove's hearty answer. There is nothing so bad as separation. I am quite of your opinion. I know what it is, for Mr. Musgrove always attends the assizes, and I am so glad when they are over, and he is back safe again. The evening ended with dancing. On its being proposed, Anne offered her services as usual, and though her eyes would sometimes fill with tears as she sat at the instrument, she was extremely glad to be employed, and desired nothing in return but to be unobserved. It was a merry, joyous party, and no one seemed in higher spirits than Captain Wentworth. She felt that he had everything to elevate him which general attention and deference, and especially the attention of all the young women, could do. The Miss Haters, the females of the family of cousins already mentioned, were apparently admitted to the honour of being in love with him and as for Henrietta and Louisa, they both seemed so entirely occupied by him, that nothing but the continued appearance of the most perfect good will between themselves could have made it credible that they were not decided rivals. If he were a little spoiled by such universal, such eager admiration, who could wonder? These were some of the thoughts which preoccupied Anne, while her fingers were mechanically at work, proceeding for half an hour together, equally without error and without consciousness. Once she felt that he was looking at herself, observing her altered features, perhaps trying to trace in them the ruins of the face which had once charmed him. And once she knew that he must have spoken of her, she was hardly aware of it till she heard the answer, but then she was sure of his having asked his partner whether Miss Elliot never danced. The answer was, "'Oh, no, never. She has quite given up dancing. She had rather play. She is never tired of playing.' Once, too, he spoke to her. She had left the instrument on the dancing being over, and he had sat down to try to make out an air which he wished to give the Miss Musgroves an idea of. Unintentionally, she returned to that part of the room. He saw her, and, instantly rising, said with studied politeness, "'I beg your pardon, madame. This is your seat.' And though she immediately drew back with a decided negative, he was not to be induced to sit down again. Anne did not wish for more of such looks and speeches. His cold politeness— his ceremonious grace, were worse than anything. End of chapter 8